Bill, what is the kind of current model or lipid hypothesis as it stands today? Well, I, I take you back. Um, and so the history of how we got here, I think, is important to answer that question. So the history of how we got here was uh, it was not uh, lost on people that cholesterol was in plaques back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Now, how it got there was a mystery. Was it made? Was it transported? It didn't appear to be made, so it had to be transported. And now you have to ask more questions. How do you move cholesterol, which is a fat, in blood, which is mostly water? And people thought, well, maybe it hitches a ride with albumin or a plasma protein, that sort of thing. But the real work here came from two guys, Goffman and Lindrigan, in the 1948 to 52 time span. And they, they characterized human lipoproteins. They're the guys who figured out that we have these, these particles. They look like tennis balls. Uh, they're hollow on the inside. And inside, which is a fat uh, safe place, the cholesterol and triglyceride get packed in the middle. And these particles are the way that we move cholesterol around. And so that was the beginning of what some people call the cholesterol hypothesis. It was really how did cholesterol get into plaque? And then what do we learn about the particles that carry cholesterol? So in my world, I'm, I'm a little careful in the way that I discuss this because I don't think it is a lipid hypothesis. I think it is a lipoprotein conversation. Lipoproteins are the core of this conversation. Uh, and this was actually what they thought would be the conversation beginning in the 50s. Uh, but it's hard to measure lipoproteins, especially back then. But you can measure cholesterol much more easily. So what you can measure easily becomes a surrogate for the rest of the story. Uh, interestingly, some pioneers uh, that were you know, giants of the day in the 60s at NIH, uh, Friedrichsen, Levy, and Lees, talked about the facts that, and they lamented this. They said, it's unfortunate that people are talking about lipoproteins as a cholesterol problem. It, really, that's not the case. Cholesterol is just kind of getting caught up in this Cholesterol is a neutral problem. fat that's stuck inside a particle. The cholesterol in HDL is the same as the cholesterol in LDL. I one see. is not good, one is not bad. One does not protect you, one does not hurt you. It's the particles that have the potential for good or for bad. And so what we think the model is today is if you have any number of prob problems or processes that give you lots of ApoB-containing lipoproteins, and that stays high for a long period of time, that is part of the process that fuels formation of plaque in the artery wall that can grow over time and under various circumstances lead to heart attacks and strokes. Is that independent of other factors you know one of the things that i was speaking to tom dayspring about when he was on my show was whether those lipoproteins i think you said there they have the potential to be good or bad are they inherently problematic or is a particular environment or concentration required yes and yes uh, so apob containing lipoproteins specifically ldl and remnants are very atherogenic um, there are lots of models where we can show that persistently high levels of these are directly related to development of plaque, independent of anything else. But like anything else in the body, multiple contributors together have a different impact than just one. So if you're a smoker, hypertensive, diabetic, uh, if there are other things going on that also set the table for atherosclerotic risk and you add a high ApoB to that, that's a very different environment than just high ApoB. Right. So yes, you can amplify the deleterious effects of ApoB by other things, but it is not true that you have to have other things for ApoB to be deleterious. Okay, so you can be otherwise completely healthy, but have an elevated ApoB above some physiologic level, and at that point, those lipoproteins will be problematic. So this is a concentration conversation. The higher, the longer, the worse. So there's not a step function or a threshold above which people are in dire straits, but it is a continuum of risk. And as you escalate the number of particles to extremely high levels and you leave them there for an extremely long period of time, uh, that would be one working example where you can say, yes, under those circumstances, um, absent some other thing we don't understand, such as favorable genetics or other factors, uh, this is a setup for plaque formation and increased atherosclerotic risk. 
So do you think that applies, and we'll unpack the triad, the lean mass hyper responder, but do you think that applies in this context of what's, you know, Dave's experience himself, where otherwise, you know, metabolically healthy, I'm assuming triglycerides, high, uh, HDL, perfect, but his LDL is high above that physiologic level? I think it's a great question. And you just teed up a different conversation. And that is that we, we're not a system that has only one thing going on at a time. So high apoB usually exists in the context of other things. In this culture, uh, high apoB is usually uh, part and parcel of insulin resistance, part and parcel of metabolic syndrome, part and parcel of prediabetes, diabetes. And so we have these other physiologic perturbances that are part of the fabric of atherosclerosis in which apoB is layered. And so that's the most common expression of high apoB related risk that we have. Another example is familial hypercholesterolemia or other genetic disorders where you just can't clear your particles well. You don't have these other processes necessarily, but you do unfortunately have a lifelong exposure to very high LDL, very high apoB, and there's a consequence to that. So we have these two different models, one which is physiologically unhealthy, the other, which is genetically driven. And in both cases, high ApoB is contributory to atherosclerosis. But the magnitude and how much risk the individual has is more than just their ApoB level. It is a combination of all these other factors. And so one of the challenges clinically, when I see somebody, if you were my patient, I would seek to understand, Simon, what's the rest of your story? Are you insulin sensitive? Or are you insulin resistant? Are you a smoker? Are you hypertensive? Are you diabetic? What other comorbid conditions do you have? What other things are important? And the guidelines are now beginning to reflect this as well. The guidelines has a whole list of things called risk-enhancing factors that you're supposed to ask about that contribute to potentially what your risk would be. And then we layer on top of that things like ApoB, LPLA, lipoproteins that are atherogenic. Right. And so you would find out all that information because it may affect how aggressive you are or proactive you are with lowering my LDL cholesterol or ApoB or how worried you would be? Yeah, I think the question you would have is if my ApoB is a bad number, what's the rest of the story? Now, we live in an age where we can do non-invasive imaging and we can get an answer as to using certain modalities. Do we see evidence of plaque already? If I see that you have plaque and you want to talk to me about your ApoB, that's a different conversation than somebody who is apparently physiologically healthy, has no evidence of plaque, has a high ApoB. And my question is, has it been that way for a long time? Is that a more recent phenomenon? The, these are important considerations. And you know, we can kind of unpack this as we go, uh, but there are combinations and permutations of this where in one extreme, let's say you're 75 years old with a zero calcium score and a high LDL. The guidelines would say statins are optional for those people. At a younger age, you tell me that you have plaque and you have a high ApoB or LDL. I'm going to tell you that getting that down is the best solution at a lipoprotein level you have to stopping the growth of plaque, regressing plaque, decreasing LDL-related risk. And the term I just used there, LDL-related risk, I think is a very important nuance because it acknowledges, on the one hand, there is risk attributable to bad or atherogenic lipoproteins, but it's only one of many actors in the story of atherosclerosis. Uh, we have lots of data where people's LDL has been really well managed, and yet they can go on to continue to have events. So we just want to paint a broader context, a broader picture that as important as it is, it's part of a bigger story. I imagine some people might push back a little bit on that last part there, and they might say, well, Bill, you might still see events because you've intervened too late in life. And I know that there are certain people out there that it seems to me at least that there's this idea that the precautionary approach that, you know, is APOB the kind of is it the spark that sets off the flame? And if so, if you just get it down to a low level early in life, are you going to help that person kind of avoid it? You know, we don't know five years, 10 years out what this person's metabolic health is, is going to look like. 
why not just aggressively lower it and get it to a, a safe level? I agree with that. So primordial prevention is don't let it happen in the first place. Now, we have experiments of nature. Uh, you can look at people who genetically have low LDL for a lifetime, and they have markedly reduced atherosclerotic risk, irrespective of whether they smoke or they're hypertensive or other things happen in their life. Because if, if you kind of mechanistically look at this, uh, you could ask, well, what's the committed step of atherosclerosis? And the committed step is forming macrophage foam cells. Formation of macrophage foam cells is the committed step of atherosclerosis. And what's a foam cell? A foam cell is a macrophage that ate atherogenic lipoproteins. So once you have begun that process, uh, you have turned on the switch. All right. So that's an important uh, caveat. And, and just you, to underline something there, that process can begin if ApoB or LDL cholesterol is elevated without systemic inflammation Correct. without insulin resistance, it can sort of instigate that. It can.